Good afternoon. It's quite a long way down there. There are people down there, I think. Yes, hello. <laughs> I hope you had a nice lunch. And you're feeling all nice and full. Not too sleepy. Uh, you're going to be scintillated now by my talk. Um, I, I would just like to say, you know, there are a number of really amazing tracks uh, at this, this summit and a number of fantastic speakers. And I think, um, you know, the choice is, is vast. So I do appreciate you, you know, you've made a choice to come and, and listen to me talk um, this afternoon. And so thank you. I appreciate it. And I, I hope you get something out of it. Uh, I'm going to talk about how uh, we at Fiserv um, and Finkit um, migrated from one uh, set of uh, development language and framework to another one. Um, I apologize to our American friends for the spelling of tires. Uh, I also apologize to our continental European friends for the miles per hour reference. We are British and we kind of just sit somewhere in the middle of everything. So. Who here knows Fiserv? Anybody familiar with Fiserv? Yeah, I've got, I, just, I, just in case no one came, I bought an entire posse of Fiservians with me, so I'd have somebody to talk to. Um, so um, Fiserv are a pretty large financial services uh, organization operating largely out of the US, although we do have a significant presence worldwide. About 24,000 associates uh, and about 12,000 customers. So uh, the scale of what we're doing is pretty big. Um, I think it's fair to say that we all exist as companies to serve our customers. The lifeblood of what we do is our customers. And I think it's quite clear that right now, the, the relentless marching forward of uh, technology is driving consumer choice. And I think Abby made a great point this morning. You know, she changed her bank. She, you know, that is not a small thing to do, right? I am so dissatisfied with the service I'm getting from my bank, I'm going to completely, up, I'm going to lift everything. I'm going to move it to some other bank. That is quite a sobering thought as a person who works for a financial services organization. <laughs> so what we're looking to do is to help our customers get what they need when they need it. And so as an enterprise development team, and as a, somebody who provides enterprise development teams, we have to be able to respond to that change. But also we have to be able to do it in a way that is you know, is safe and secure and, and that scale. And the security piece, the compliance piece, you know, financial services, regulation, as you can imagine, we are you know, constrained by a number of um, quite difficult <laughs> regulations. This all comes into play right here. And I guess this is where Finkit comes in. So, um, hi, I'm Anushka Streets. <laughs> I uh, lead the engineering function for Finkit. These are some of our number. We are all here today uh, and tomorrow and more than happy to talk to you about anything you want to talk about within reason, keep it safe. Um, and uh, basically, FinKit is a platform that's built upon a Cloud Foundry application runtime, uh, managed by Bosch, which we love, in case you didn't get that uh, uh, this from this morning. And um, which is designed entirely around uh, a, a developer experience, a frictionless development experience, obviously underpinned by all the goodness of Cloud Foundry, but we've then enhanced that and added a developer environment, a uh, build tool chain and pipeline, and some kind of um, uh, compliance and regulatory wrapping around that as well, which I'll, I'll kind of touch on a little bit later. So. There's a bit of it. There is a little bit of history here. And so as well as our, we, we provide this platform that allows our associates and our developers to be able to build really quickly. But that platform in and of itself also needs to be kept current and up to date. 
and uh, respond to change. Customers want different things, different features need to exist on the platform, and we need to be able to deliver those in and of itself in a safe, in a safe way. And so over a period of time, as we've been running uh, the Thinkit project, we made some decisions at the outset of that, which we changed. And this is one of them. And this is how the fact that, and I'm going to talk to you about what we changed and why we changed it, and importantly, how we changed that in a way that didn't impact our consumers and a way that was in zero downtime. And it was all underpinned by the Cloud Foundry uh, ecosystem that we run upon. I want to set some house rules, OK? This is not the start of a flame war between two languages and two frameworks. I'm going to tell you what they were. So we moved from Scala and Acker to Java and Spring Boot. And I'm very comfortable with that decision. It was the right decision for us. I completely and utterly appreciate there are going to be people out there who just love Scala and Acker and think it's the best thing ever. And why on earth would you want to move from Scala to Java and Spring Boot's really bloaty. It, may, it does things I don't want it to do. It forces... Yeah, I know. We happen to quite like it. And so... Um, <laughs> I get it. It's horses for courses. I use that quite a lot. And um, it works for us. It might not work for you. But this is not about language A, language B, or X and Y in this case. It's about how we made that change and how Cloud Foundry made that change. I'm more than happy to have a conversation with you about why. Uh, you know, um, and we will go into some of that. Um, but you know, we'll be in the booth crawl later on. My orange associates over there are also uh, available to talk about this. Uh, more than happy uh, to do that over a beer. Um, it's also not a final and best practice architecture for building cloud native system. I think it's fair to say that um, software engineering is a, an act of um, relentless compromise. And so uh, at any given point in time, your system is in some sort of suboptimal wrongness. OK, so what you have to do is kind of build a platform that will allow you to change it. Um, and that's, that's what we're all about. So at Finkit, we're all about uh, having a frictionless, really pleasurable developer experience, which is actually one of the reasons why we made this change. But also, we were about being able to operate that sustainably and reliably on day two and beyond. And so. Again, there might be things that kind of come up, and you see I am going to show you some boxes and lines. You may not agree with how we've organized those boxes and lines. That's cool. I'm happy to talk about it over a beer. So what are part of this talk? I am going to tell you a bit about Thinkit and what it does, its useful context. I'm also going to tell you why we made the change, and I'm going to tell you how we made that change with zero downtime and what we learned, which was quite a lot. So, just checking time. You all know that, right? <laughs> that's, that's quite familiar, I would hope. And so, this is um, basically lifted from, I think, a Chip Childers slideshow. <laughs> Cheers, Chip. Um, and the, the kind of box in the middle with the light bulb is kind of, this is, our, this is our service, this is our idea, this is what we want to build on Cloud Foundry. And these are kind of not, it's not complete, right? So these are the kind of core elements of the Cloud Foundry platform that we call upon every day as developers and probably don't even know it. And that's kind of the point. That's kind of why it's so great about to use Cloud Foundry as a developer. I see F push. And I don't have to worry about my routing. My routing is all taken care of for me. I don't have to worry about my application lifecycle and how my app is being staged and managed. And I don't have to worry about how it's running. I don't need to worry about the Diego cells and how many instances. And I don't need to worry about if my app is um, up or down because I can't find just gonna, it's just going to sort all that stuff out for me. It's just, it takes, um, I think, it, 
uh, Dan Jones gave a really good talk, actually, a couple of years ago, about reducing the boxes, about things you need to think about when you're uh, a developer. And it, I think Cloud Foundry does a fantastic job of reducing the cognitive load on your developers to kind of, you know, you, I only have to think about pushing that app. And what Thinkit does is layer on top of that, if I push the right button, some other kind of enhancements and extensions to the platform, which are specifically built around supporting services for financial services. Okay? So we have a protection layer, which kind of manages um, tokenization of sensitive data. And so in the, in the EU right now, we all care quite a lot about GDPR. It's quite um, present. Um, but there's also um, PCI and other kind of regulatory compliance things that we care about. Um, which the protection layer helps do, us do. We also have, and we provide out of the box, some um, help around um, identity. Now, we're not talking about identity in the kind of UAA terms of identity, but actually kind of consumer identity onto the platform. We have a kind of federated identity model. Uh, we also uh, provide support around kind of multi-tenancy. So it's a, you know, it's a fully multi-tenanted platform. So we have multiple customers on the same platform. So we have services around that. Again, this is simplified. Uh, and we have a, a kind of agreement service, and uh, below that, then a kind of um, uh, abstracted interfaces into some compliant backing services. So, an example there would be kind of persistence and data store. And then with that, so none of our developers will directly CF push, they Git push. And so they'll git push into a pipeline, which then goes through all the various kind of um, build and test, and, and then finally deploys um, onto this platform. Now, uh, there's also a Vagrant-based developer environment that we have that our developers use. Um, again, just to kind of get rid of snowflakes and to get rid of uh, any kind of inconsistencies around developer um, uh, development kind of experience and so that if someone says you know oh my jvm is, is not you know i've got the wrong version of the jvm it's like well if you've got the wrong version everybody's got the wrong version right and if we need to make that change we can make that change once and push it out to every single developer really really quickly it's all about consistency um, and, and um, reliability of the same uh, the same experience for every developer The services that I've highlighted there in green were written in Scala and uh, the ACA framework. Um, the remaining services, uh, and again, I'm not going to go into the history of why. I don't think it's particularly relevant, um, again, but I am happy to talk about that. Um, and then we have other services that were built on the platform using Java and Spring Boot. Uh, it kind of worked out that uh, a third-party team uh, that we had based out in uh, Romania were writing the Scala ACA services, and the Java Spring Boot services will be written from the UK. What happened over a period of time is the relationship with that third party kind of petered out, as they kind of do. We had attrition, and these services slowly started to come back over to the UK, left with my Java Spring Boot guys to maintain. There were a number of challenges with that. So first of all, as you can imagine, there's a pretty big skills gap between, um, yes, OK, Scala and Java, they both run on the JVM, yeah, woo -hoo. That's about where, you know, and I, yeah, OK, I can write Scala and I can just miss off the semicolons and it's pretty much, you know, we're fine. But the problem is it's, it's more than that. It was the framework as well. It was the ACA framework, which was a completely different kind of model. Um, and uh, having been used to working with the, the Java and Spring Boot model, that was a kind of a, a quite a big kind of step change. Uh, we did send people on training, but I think you could all agree that if I send you on a five-day training course, that's not going to make you the you know overnight the best Scala ACA developer there is out there. Um, there was some technical conflict, so um, at the time, and I know this isn't necessarily the true now, but at the time it was actually quite difficult to run um, Acker with Cloud Foundry. There was some, again, if we go back to that whole reducing boxes thing, there was some additional cognitive overload for the developers to have to kind of get through. Um, but also, um, we'd had to write um, quite a significant amount of kind of 
middleware uh, to support Scala the same way that we were able to support Java. So Spring Boot gave us a whole ton of stuff that we, you know, that we just used, right? So we just used the bootstrapping and we plugged in Spring Cloud for our IaaS uh, layer and uh, Spring Security and it just all just worked. And none of that was there with Scala. So we had to, um, that was again, a, if you're talking about shrinking the boxes, this was hard and this was something else we had to operate and um, look after. And then you kind of, you put those two things together and you kind of end up with kind of human limitations. And so you got, we had two types of developer. Um, and we had the, the really keen, I'm gone on, I've gone on my Scala training course, I love it, I actually embrace this technology, I want to use this technology. And they were, yes, you know, that this is cool, I'm getting to learn something new. And they did, they learnt it, the market rates for Scala went through the roof, and they left. It was great, not. Um, and then you had the other side of the, uh, of the coin. Well, I really understand, I'm, I'm expert in Java Spring Boot. I really like writing this, and now you're asking me to write in this thing. That makes no sense, and actually, it's fighting against me. The way that we're using it with ACR and CF, it, it's not helping me, it's actually making it harder. I'm not happy. So I've got unhappy developers, and developers who are leaving, <laughs> and when they leave, I can't replace them because the, you know, um, our primary um, data center, I'm just checking time, is um, in Cardiff, in South Wales. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Pay de Gal, Wales. Amazing place, come visit. Um, <laughs> um, they, uh, it was hard to recruit these people with, those, with, the, with the right level of skill. So... <laughs> And then there was the last thing, which was kind of, you know, our platform is all built around day two support, um, day two operation, and making that as easy as possible. And there was a number of, uh, there were a number of tooling um, decisions that we were unable to make because Scala just simply either didn't support them or uh, there were third party products that were available on the market, but they were prohibitively expensive. So I'm talking about things like just being able to scan for licenses. Right, this is really important in, a, in the regulatory kind of world that we live in. We have to be able to scan for licenses. Um, you know, static code analysis was really hard. And that's something that you get for free with kind of SonarCube with um, Java. It's really easy. Uh, and so um, yeah, all of that kind of stuff was, was uh, pretty hard. And so all of these four things together were kind of adding up into something where the total cost of ownership of these services was just too high. It was, and it was obvious, and it was obvious to us obviously as an engineering function, but it was obvious to our product team as well. These services, if I kind of wick back, these services are the kind of services that um, uh, are core to our platform. There are others, but these are kind of core to our platform. And so they, they kind of change quite a lot. And every time it was like, uh, yeah, we need to make a change to the identity service. Okay, uh, we'll just wait while, you know, Bob gets his head around the, the, the Scala code in that. And we kind of had this problem where it was a vicious circle where developers who didn't understand the code enhanced the service but they didn't properly understand it, and so it, you had this kind of mini balls of mud being created <laughs> all over the place, and so it was just a mess, frankly. So we said, do you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna bin it, and we're gonna write them uh, in Java and Spring Boot. But we needed to be able to convince um, senior management that that was the right thing to do. That was quite hard. <laughs> Um, senior management see something that is working, that, is fun that functionally you know, does what it's supposed to do. So why on earth would I throw that in the bin and write it again for no actual functional benefit? You're just gonna give me exactly what I add, and for, you know, for what? <laughs> <laughs> and so what we were able to show is that, look, we write Java Spring Boot services, and they take us this amount of time. And whenever we come along to write a, a change for the identity service or the um, agreement service, it's taking us this amount of time. And it was fairly crude, but we were able to show it's longer, right? We were also able to show um, that um, uh, through our product owner, who was engaged with us through this process, who was actually really supportive as well, saying, yeah, actually, guys, I'm seeing this. And so I had allies across the business who were able to go, yeah, this is the right thing to do. And we got it. We got it through, and they agreed. Um, and so what did we do? 
So, um, who's f familiar with kind of Martin Fowler, Strangler Pattern? Yay. Um, so, I mean, it, what I'm going to show you now is actually really straightforward. And the, but the reason it was straightforward is because of Cloud Foundry, right? It's kind of the, um, those guys are there going, it wasn't straightforward. <laughs> I'm like, head of engineering, yeah, it was trivial. Um, and so, uh, for most of those services, we were able to kind of just use a strangler pattern, and I'll show you how we did that. Uh, for the, there was one particular service that that wouldn't work for, and I'll tell you about why that is. And so there we go. We're going to use the agreement service as the example. Um, and that's running there. It's running quite happily. Um, and we've got kind of post, get, delete. And we're going to, first thing we're going to do is we're going to just create a, a, a shell. And all that shell is going to do is route straight to the is going to reach straight to the old service. This was, again, relatively trivial because we're contract first, right? So we're an API first company. And so it was dead simple. These were just swagger specs that would just kind of move over and they just pass through straight to that service. And then what we were able to do is kind of a resource at a time, kind of switch those over um, and change the routing so that um, as a resource at a time, as a new resource comes online, we're able to point that back um, directly uh, through the routing. And again, this is all managed. You know, this is all really trivial configuration through the through the um, through the config services that um, Cloud Foundry provide. Uh, and then just chomp our way through it. I appreciate that this is a nice, straightforward, you know, relatively kind of straightforward use case. The, um, the backing, you know, we've got a shared backing service for a start, right, which, you know, made our life a, a lot easier. Uh, I, the, that doesn't preclude you using it for other use cases. You can absolutely use this for other use cases. You just probably have to think a little bit more about kind of replication of data. Um, what's really important here and something else that Cloud Foundry provides is metrics and logging and the ability to know what is being called, when it's being called, how it's being called. And so we were re it was really dead straightforward. We could see no one's calling the agreement service anymore. It's done. We can bin it. And so we cut that off. We undeployed it. We unmapped the routes, and it was gone. Boom. It was that easy. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> so, we strangled those three, um, and there were a couple of others as well, but just keeping it simple. And then there was a kind of proxy service that kind of is a hub that kind of sits between uh, all of our services, kind of acts as a bit of an orchestrator across some of our services. Because of the way that that um, kind of sits in the middle, and because of um, some kind of routing problems, we realized that we weren't just going to be able to, we, particularly around identity, we weren't just going to be able to, a resource at a time, bleed that over. It was, going to be, it was going to be really difficult. So what we did there was just do a complete version upgrade in situ. And so obviously we're making sure that the API is exactly the same, okay? Um, and what we were able to do is, again, now um, we've got the blue-green deployment feature um, for, again, which is out of the box with Cloud Foundry. We'd written our, obviously, um, our pipeline kind of supports that blue-green deployment. Um, and the fact that we run this on Bosch means that we've got absolute confidence it, that we don't have any configuration drift between our environments. So we know that our test, sit, staging, and prod environments are all the same and are going to behave in the same way. And so we were able to just click this through. Again, it was that easy, <laughs> honest. And then it went. So did it deliver what we thought it would? And, and I think it's fair to say that, yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a really big success. Um, we were able to uh, replace um, all of our remaining Scala services, both through the Strangler pattern and the kind of more standard kind of version upgrade process. We did it all in about six weeks um, and with zero downtime. Uh, nobody noticed. 
And what was, and what was quite, yeah, apart from the developers who were doing it, obviously, um, the, uh, what was really interesting was at the same time that we were doing this work, we were also moving cloud providers. So we moved, for, we moved from a managed service um, uh, Cloud Foundry provider to an open source to open source, and we also moved from uh, an, uh, one IaaS provider to another IaaS provider. <laughs> and what again, I just want to emphasise, because Cloud Foundry was the common kind of delta between all of this, it means that um, you know from a developer point of view, if I'm one of the the associates that kind of building on the platform, I don't see any of that because you know I'm git pushing to I'm, you know, I'm git pushing to my pipeline and that's just CF pushing to a cloud foundry somewhere the fact that it's on some different IaaS or it's a different provider doesn't matter and that's kind of where some of the greatness of cloud foundry come in so yes we um, we were actually able to recruit people now because Java and Spring Boot is far more prevalent in the market space uh, the retention went up. We had happier, more um, satisfied developers who were building in uh, a language that they understood and felt comfortable with. Um, and again, we, that day two stuff, we had all that kind of um, compliance out of the box again with um, you know, the ability to automatically scan and know what our licenses are doing and pull that into our compliance framework and the associated reduction in lead times. Everybody's happy. We did learn some pretty big lessons along the way, though. This, I know I kind of trivialized it a little bit and said it was, you know, look, it's easy because I can just click the clicker. It's like, it's really simple. But there were um, a number of really big lessons. So, um, and this was, uh, behavior is the asset. In fact, it's one of our principles, right? Behavior is the asset, not the lines of code that you write. In fact, lines of code are just a cost that you have to maintain. And so that was um, the message that we gave to our senior exec when we wanted to do this. Um, the way that we can help ourselves with that is to write really good tests so that if we change, decide that we want to change something later, then it's really easy to prove that you've done it the right way. Some areas of this we had done a pretty good job. I think it's fair to say we could have done better in other areas and we made it slightly more difficult for ourselves than it could have been. And I think we learned quite a lot from that exercise about how important it is to have good tests. Be able to measure stuff. And again, Cloud Foundry really helps you with this, right? So Cloud Foundry is the log regator and be able to get logs and metrics, use them. They provide you with some really interesting and useful data. One to support things like use cases when you do go to your boss and say, can I do this crazy thing? Uh, but also just to have good insight into what's going on on your platform. Um, the whole kind of just do something thing, um, We'd kind of already started doing some of this stuff as kind of a little bit of skunk type works. Um, and so we had some data and additional metrics to be able to give to our product owner and to our execs when we were doing this. Kind of just do it, get on with it, you know, don't hang around. Training helps, but it is definitely not a silver bullet. Uh, you know, I think, how many, how many software developers in the room? Awesome. Is, this, so is it something that you've practiced really hard and, and learned over many years to become really good at? Yeah, I think it is. It, well, it is for me. I, well, I became okay at it. And, <laughs> and so I think, you know, by thinking we can just send people on a five-day training course and then they're going to come back and they're going to be these great enterprise developers immediately is a nonsense. It takes time uh, to become really skilled in your craft. Um, so just watch for that. Um, again, we've t the kind of whole watch what you're doing is kind of linked to the metrics piece and the contract first um, services. Again, if, if we hadn't have done that and if we didn't have well-defined swagger specs, I don't know how we'd have done this. Equally, I'm not sure how we'd have done this if we weren't running this on a, on a platform like Cloud Foundry. We'd have had to write a whole ton of routing and craziness to be able to make that work. And the last thing is the feedback from the teams that this was really dull. <laughs> it's kind of, um, you know, it was repetitive and quite mundane. You know, it's stuff we've already done and we're doing it again. But, you know, a lot of them understood why they were doing it, but maybe just mix the teams up a bit. 
and make it a bit more uh, um, interesting and uh, rather than um, just say, right, you're doing this for the next six weeks. It's fine. And I think that was it, unless anybody's got any questions. I've got about a minute. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I have a question about the, um, the slide where you show your, your new Spring Boot application and the old uh, service. But you said that you started first with um, the post and yeah. the, um, the delete service. So we didn't. You didn't? No, okay. we'd start with get. There. I don't know why it's there. We started with the idempotent one, item okay. ones okay. first. So because Cloud Foundry, yeah. as far as I know, doesn't provide <laughs> HTML <laughs> 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 okay, but then I don't have a question because the, my question would have been how did you solve that? Because Cloud Foundry doesn't provide verb based routing, as far as I know. So you can just route, um, you can specify the route, but you cannot say get goes to this service, post goes to that service, and. Yeah, we did. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. Okay, okay. okay. My bad. <laughs> I, I wish you solved it. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Oh, there's one right at the back. Uh, how do you find uh, the contract-driven uh, design that you just said? How Sorry, I, can't, I didn't hear the first bit. Okay. How, how did you define, I know it's a bit technical, the contract-driven way of, um, of those services? Perhaps that's something we should have a chat about in the bar. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. That's why. Okay, that's quite you. detailed, yeah. All right. Okay. I think that's my time. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions or afterwards. <laughs>